All right, uh, gonna get started. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, quick, uh, quick point of procedure. Um, apologies, this is not malware, malware deobfuscation for defenders. I wanted to attend that talk too, so I, I share your disappointment. Um, in lieu of that, it, if, if you guys want to go check out another track, that's totally fine, I won't be offended. Um, in lieu of that, I'm gonna be discussing getting started in ICS and OT, not just for engineers. So quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed throughout this presentation are solely those of the presenter, yours truly, and do not necessarily represent those of Burns McDonald or 1898 Co the company I work for. Quick agenda, we're gonna go through intro, problem, anecdotes, you guys can see it for there. Um, a little bit about myself, my name's Tyler Jansen, I work for 1898 Co's managed security services. Um, been working in cybersecurity for eight years, got started in the Navy in 2016, working as a discovery and counter infiltration analyst. Uh, the Navy's changed the name of that role probably four times since I got out, but essentially it's a cybersecurity analyst, but discovering counter infiltration sounds cool, so that's the one I tell people. Um, I got scared, and I emphasize scared, into ICS and OT in 2018. Um, just the, the, it was in an exercise, and they were going over just the, the risk, the threats, the capabilities, and, and just how exposed some of our critical infrastructure and environments are and it just, it's kind of a, a crystalline moment where like, oh, I'm in danger. And so that, that uh, crystallizing moment for me happened in 2018. Um, and 2022 started with 1898 and co. And my, my experience in ICS and OT has spanned uh, quite, a different, quite a variety of industries. I've worked with power generation facilities, uh, oil refineries, um, fuel storage, pipeline, weight, uh, water, wastewater, um, building controls, maritime uh, navigation and engineering. So qu quite, quite a few different industries. Uh, some quick terminology, just in case you're not familiar with ICS or all the other acronyms that are in there. Uh, we got the big broad terms, ICS, that's industrial control systems, operational technology, that's uh, just, a, a, again, another kind of catch-all term for the, the computers and systems that manage a physical process, right? And then w within those, we have, we have control systems. So we have building automation systems. Think your, the computers that control your HVAC, your, your building access, uh, various alarms, that, that, that's your building automation systems. Distributed control systems, those are what's gonna be running like your power plant, your oil refinery, what have you. That's uh, where, where you, you, you imagine like operators sitting in a room looking at a bunch of screens saying, okay, like the turbine's spinning at the right speed, it's the right temperature. That, that's your distributed control system. Uh, programmable logic controller, that's kind of what the, it's, it's in between your, your embedded field devices and your high level DCS. And so that, that's the, more localized computers that are controlling the various uh, field devices. Um, and then the last one I'll, I'll touch on is SCADA, so that's supervisory control and data acquisition. So that's a, a control system that's gonna be managing like a, a pipeline. It, it's meant for systems that are they're very far and disparate. So imagine a pipeline spanning you know, hundreds of miles, maybe you got like uh, some product you're trying to move from North Dakota down to New Orleans, right? and you need to make sure that you have the right um, volume of product going through the pipeline, you need to check the temperature, the flow rate, the pressure within there, and you need measurements throughout the hundreds of miles of pipeline you have, right? And so the SCADA systems are speci specifically designed to uh, gather those metrics and then manage whatever controls need to be in there in case you need to like flush the pipe or shut off a section of it. That's where the control and data acquisition comes in. Um, a few other terms on there in the uh, field devices. We, we got HMI, so that's, uh, as, the, as it's spelled out there, human machine interface. Think of like um, your, your thermostat at home where you, you, you tap on it, change your uh, temperature in your house. You have various uh, kind of embedded screens to control whatever local process you're looking at. Um, intelligent electronic devices and RTUs, those are other just kind of like low level embedded field devices 
that are going to be controlling the other uh, listed devices we have listed out here in the net spots, the actuators, gauges, pumps, sensors, valves. So th those are the actual um, controls. So imagine like a, a fuel tanker, right? Or a, a, at a fuel farm, big fuel tank, got tons of diesel or w whatever, choose your product. You need to be able to track um, how, how full it is. You don't want it to overfull, be uh, over, overflow or to get too low. So you need sensors in there to make sure that you, you have control of, of where it's at. All right, so the problem, the whole point of this, this talk. I believe there is a shortage in ICS OT focused cybersecurity professionals due to misconceptions and perceived uh, preconceived notions about working in ICS, uh, preventing otherwise capable and I dare say sorely needed professionals from, from getting involved. Um, and this problem I think is exacerbated by, by several other problems. The first one being persistent threats to, to ICS and OT. You guys might have seen in the news just the other week, uh, director of FBI, Christopher Wray, testified to Congress that uh, Chinese hackers are already in U.S. critical infrastructure. That probably didn't just happen last week or the other week. It's, it's probably been going on for a while, right? And, and not just in our country, other countries as well. And there, there's historical examples of that. We got Stuxnet in 2010, Black Energy, the Ukraine power grid 2015, uh, Trisis hit Saudi Arabia in 2017, Colonial Pipeline. That didn't even actually hit the ICS. That just targeted the billing system for the pipeline. And so it, it's, it's causing effects to our critical infrastructure without actually getting to the, the, I, the ICS and OT itself, right? And then the, the incentives kind of behind these attacks, money, have the meme there, like, why did you ransom the pipeline? Because money. And then uh, subkinetic warfare, right? So can nation states have some kind of effect, cause some kind of uh, disruption, degradation to their adversaries without being bombed or having boots in into their country? Yes, that's still possible, and so the incentive remains. All right. The other exacerbating problem is workforce gaps. Now, this is uh, a graphic from from NIST published last June, and there's a lot of numbers being thrown at you here. Uh, one thing just to highlight is the energy utilities on there. So just relevant to the ICS, um, only 20% of energy utility respondents think they have the right, have uh, enough uh, people and resources to, to manage what they have. Um, now, this is describing the entirety of the cybersecurity workforce, not just the ICS or OT workforce. And then uh, another study published last October from ISC Squared, that's the organization that does CSSP, right? Their cybersecurity workforce study showed that uh, 11, that the US workforce grew by 11% last, last year from 2002, and the North American workforce gap increased by 20%. So overall, the overall industry of cybersecurity, right, that there's a growth in the gap outpacing the number of work, uh, professionals we're, we're, in, we're adding in. And then uh, Dean Parsons, um, a contributor and instructor for SANS ICS, he published uh, some findings in November that only 52% of OT and ICS facilities actually have an ICS uh, incident response plan. So I mean, that's you know, pick your local utility, flip a coin, and th that's their chances of actually having a, a plan for, for if they get hit with ransomware, that they're gonna have a, a plan that they can go ahead and execute, right? Um, and another finding from that in the graphic right there, uh, the, the organizations he, he polled, deploying trained OT security defenders to leverage their, their network visibility is their number one priority. So. Just do we have the right, there, there's plenty of technologies out there to deploy, so you, you can get your, your IDS out there, your IPS, your EDR, but do we have the qualified people to manage and respond and, and analyze the data that, that's getting? And so going through all this, uh, persistent kind of question remains, what percentage of this total workforce gap is specific to ICSOT? I, I haven't been able to find a good answer. 
and not to outsource my not to outsource my homework here, but if anybody has a good source for that or thinks like they they have they know that, please let me know. I would I, I would love to know or come find me afterwards. But uh, I have not been able to find a good answer to that. So that kind of leaves us to assume that there's there's a gap that that we don't know, and so presumably, if the entirety, entire workforce is lagging behind, then it's probably the same for ICS and OT. And then, if we're missing these people, what's preventing, peop what's preventing those that are in the uh, community from getting involved in ICS and OT? So here's a few anecdotes. Just uh, reaching out to colleagues and throughout the cybersecurity community that I've, I've heard from people. Won't read this out to you guys, but a uh, bit, bit of a description of me coming to people and asking, hey, why are you interested in ICS and OT? Yeah. All right. So going through kind of my, my anecdotal evidence of, of chatting with, with uh, the community, uh, these are the three barriers to entry I identified. People believe that there's a skill mismatch, skill mismatch between general IT, cybersecurity, and ICS and OT. Just general unfamiliarity with the space and not really sure how to get started. And then um, a, a feeling of lack of opportunity to gain that knowledge if they did know how to get it and how to then monetize it. Because I mean, we're, we're working professionals, we need a job, we can't just do this for as a hobby. Plenty of people do, but you know, you can monetize it all the better. So here's a quick uh, comparison of skills. So you kind of, kind of answered it already, but the, the core, core competencies and skills that I think a general cybersecurity analyst uses and what you need as a cybersecurity professional in ICSOT, I, I believe it, it overlaps the same. It, it's, it's, it's the same skills and competencies. So routing and switching. Do you, you understand VLANs and network segmentation, port mirroring and spans? Like, ho hopefully your, your analysts understand that, and that translates to ICSOT. Network protocol, protocols and TCP IP, right? You, you don't know every single protocol that's out there. You don't know everything about it, but you, you know the basics. You know HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, FTP, right? There, there's core, core pieces that you, you know, and you can apply the concepts to new protocols as you as you run into them, right? Firewall management. Do you know? Do you know the basics of how a firewall works? Do you know, like implicit deny? It might be a different vendor in ICS, but it's still kind of the, the core piece of how are you configuring your firewall? Network architecture. How, how's the the overall network going to be laid out? How are endpoints communicating? How does that affect things? The architecture is going to be different in ICS and OT, but the the concept behind it, like. We have endpoints that users use, and they reach out and communicate to some kind of server or service, right? We have, there'll be, there'll be cases where you have um, different types of endpoints, but the, the, the core piece of it is you're, you're still monitoring a network communication. And then uh, operating system architectures. How are your engineering workstations laid out? How are your, uh, your historians and servers organized with their file directories, where the startup files, because attackers are targeting the same stuff in ICS. It, they're, they're going after the same types of operating systems, at least at, a, at uh, certain levels within the, if, if you're familiar with the Purdue model, um, the, the control level at uh, three is, is, is still mostly Windows and, and Unix architecture, so that's still relevant. Um, security technologies, IDS, IPS, EDR. The way you go about deploying them might be different, but the technologies themselves themselves don't differ much. You're still either monitoring network traffic, trying to block network traffic, or you're trying to deploy some kind of agent executable or service onto a host to monitor for file or configuration changes. And then threat methodologies. Do you, under, do you understand how an attacker might try and get into an environment? Say, maybe there, you have a VPN from New York to your power plant, and it, your, the business leaders are using that VPN to get data from the operating environment. 
that's an attack vector that an attacker might want to go after, right? So the, the being able to understand how attacker might approach uh, compromising your network, that still, that concept is, is still applicable here. So there's all these similarities, so what's different? There's, there's industry specific knowledge. So the, there, all, all that terminology I just flashed at you guys a few minutes ago, that's different obviously. And th there, there's quite a few more concepts that I'm not gonna go through here today because I mean, you, you look at like SANS has I think four weeks of classes all dedicated to ICS, so I'm not gonna be able to get through all of it in an hour. So not even gonna try. But there's plenty of, there's lots of industry specific knowledge. Um, the safety culture, that, that's, that's one of the big things that's different with ICS. So these environments are dangerous environments. Things can go boom, things can release poisonous gases, um, it, can, it can cause harm to the community, you could like, poison waterways, all, all, all different ways things or people can get hurt. And so the, these environments already have a very well-established safety culture. And so as security professionals coming into these environments, we have to be respectful of that. We have to, um, we, we have to adhere and kind of follow their lead in, in terms of safety being number one. And then that comes down into the priorities of, of how we go about um, our, our, our overall approach to security. So you'll see the, the um, triangle we have there. The, typically it's the CIA triad, right? You'll notice I've put availabil availability up top here. That's because in these environments, they're, they're all about uptime. You, you don't want your power plant going down because you need to do Patch Tuesday, right? Like, you, you, we're, we're not going to tell the, 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 the town, hey, sorry, we're going to have a blackout for, for a few hours while we, while we update everything, right? You, you got to keep everything up and running, number one, because that's how the, the business, because they're, they're businesses, that's how they make money is uptime. And then it's, it's not just, oh, we lost money while we're down. It can take a lot of money to come down. It can take a lot of money just to restart. Because, and when you make changes, sometimes you have to recertify like, that the environment's safe to run or there's some kind of regulatory, regulatory uh, check you have to do and it can cost money to bring out the regula regulators to come out and verify, yes, you guys are good to go back up. And so availability is just hyper important. And then the, the data you're seeing in ICS you don't have as much need for confidentiality because a lot of the data is, hey, what's, what's, the, what's the temperature in the, on this valve or within that pipeline? And so it's just, it's pulling like every couple seconds or every couple minutes, like, hey, what's the temperature? And so we, we don't need to worry about the confidentiality of that because there's, there's, there, there are ways to abuse it, but it's less critical information because it's just, hey, register, what, what, what temperature is that? It's, 50 degrees Celsius, it's still 50 degrees Celsius, it's for, right, so it doesn't matter. The, the integrity, that is important, but availability is number one. And then the, the impacts of compromise, and that kind of gets back to the, our, the uh, safety culture, and that when things go wrong, when things get compromised, the potential impact, the risk is much higher. So we already kind of touched on that, that things can go boom, chemical, Chemicals can get released, gas goes out, it can cause environmental issues. You, you can use your imagine to think of all the different ways a power plant or, or pipeline misbehaving could, could cause issues. Okay, so we've talked about that there's a, not so much a steals mismatch, mismatch, but just the, the environments that we employ our skills is different. And so we need knowledge to know how we need to appropriately apply, apply these skills in these environments. So you need to know the ICS and OTs, like device specific terminology that we kind of went over and there's lots more. I just, we didn't need to do a, a spelling and vocabulary quiz for, for an hour. So save you guys from that. Um, th there's different protocols in these environments and then uh, the regulations and governance are, are kind of the, the, the top three things to be familiar with when you're we're first getting started in ICS. So just flashing that back. Um, 
for industrial, pro industrial protocols. Here's a couple of just um, basic ones for, for when you're getting started. Modbus, if anyone's ever heard of that. Uh, 502 TCP. So that's um, an open source protocol that is employed by, by a lot of different vendors um, using a lot of different environments. DNP3, usually in um, the energy and power, <coughs> energy and power space. Uh, BACnet, that's used for building automation control. That's the BAC there, building automation control network. And then there, there's just a plethora of proprietary vendor protocols. So e each of those vendors I have listed up there are going to have like their own proprietary. Like Siemens has S7, GE has SRTP. And a lot of these are going to be specific to the, to the devices and environment they're, they're, they're deployed in. Um, and it can be difficult to get exposure to those unless you're working in those environments. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on ways you can, you can try and get uh, some information on those here in a little bit. Um, one thing to note with these, though, is uh, these ICS and OT protocols, these weren't developed as your standard um, TCP IP stack kind of uh, thought process. Th these, these are old. They've typically been around from when like the, these industrial environments were built, so think like maybe the 70s, the 80s, they weren't built with uh, security in mind. There's not a whole lot of authentication or, or any, anything like that built into it. So these, these protocols were just, they're originally serial communications, and so they're all built around, hey, we need to send accurate data as frequently as possible. And so it was very lightweight, just, hey, send the data, send the data, send the data, and send the right data. And so these protocols can be pretty easily abused. For example, like a Modbus has um, one of the functions in it, it can do uh, multiple writes. So you'll have um, various, let me go back here. You'll, you'll have like a PLC up top. And then you maybe you'll have um, some sensors deployed throughout your environment, and usually you'll be running a read multiple registers. So so that's be, that would be hey go to these sensors and read get the value from from register 101 right, and I'll go to each sensor and pull that information. But you can also do a multiple write, and I'll say hey go go to those same register write write a set value to register 101 on these sensors. But there, there's no limit to how you, how you um, structure that, that write command. So you could say, we have our normal go write to uh, register 101 and do it for all these, uh, these sensors. But then that, you can kind of tack on on the back to rewrite to the same register over. And there's no way to verify that unless you have some kind of sensor or analyst who knows, oh yeah, there, there's, there's nothing that's gonna put a cap on whether or not you can write or read from the same register multiple times. And so th there's just a, a lot of um, aspects like that in these protocols that can be abused. All right. um, an another big thing in these environments is the governance and regulations. There's a lot and it varies quite a bit from, from industry to industry. So the, the first two items we have up there are broad guidelines and frameworks. So NIST Special Publication 800-82-REV3, that's just a guide to OT security. Um, that borrows actually a lot from the second item there, ISA, IEC 62443. Um, th that's put out by the uh, International Society of Automation, global standard, uh, most widely recognized authority on, on ICS and OT security. Um, and then we've, we, we've got DHS and CISA, they're, they're doing most of the kind of um, protection, providing resources to, to various organizations and, and occasionally providing response capabilities. They, and they actually just had a, um, a new draft rule put out for incident response reporting, uh, if anyone's familiar with that, Circea just outlining uh, how quickly and which organizations need to respond if they, uh, if they get hit by ransomware. And then we've, we've got EPA is in charge of cybersecurity standards for, and regulations for water, uh, NERC for the uh, electricity and power, so power generation, transmission, distribution, uh, TSA for rail and pipelines, 
So it, it, it varies quite a bit and it, it's, it's changing still. It, it's not very well um, settled, that's probably the right term. So some resources to get smart on this kind of stuff. Uh, CISA's virtual learning platform, they have 13 free online courses, about 16 hours to go through. They also have a couple instructor-led courses that, um, that are pretty good. They actually host those um, instructor-led ones live if you want, but you gotta travel out to Idaho National Labs. It's nice out there, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it can be a little chilly. Um, but they, they also have an, uh, an online option for those. Um, another great resource is Rob Lee's, Rob Lee's blog for getting started in ICS data. If you're not familiar with Rob Lee, he's the CEO and one of the founders of Dragos, a uh, local company just down the road a bit. Um, that's got a lot of great uh, reading resources, um, information on starting your own home lab, um, and all kinds of stuff. And it, it's not just focused on the ICS. He also has resources on the more engineering side of things too, if you want to start getting a little more informed on that. Um, some resources for just getting familiar with some of the protocols. Uh, Mod, there's Modbus samples on the Zephyr project. So they, they've got um, PTAP captures that you can download, throw into Wireshark, and just start getting familiar with uh, how, how those, those protocols work. Um, if you are more of a, if you, if you want like a out, kind of like that RFC essentially of, of Modbus without actually having to read the RFC, um, Fernhill software has a pretty good explanation on that. Um, PLC tables, that's a kind of commercial off the shelf site that'll sell trainer kits for like PLC programming. So if you want to learn how to uh, write programs for Siemens S7, or for uh, Mitsubishi or GE, any of like their PLCs, you can you can purchase their uh, their stuff all through like PLC tables, and they'll they include um, the software licensing and the the actual um, like PLC itself, some cabling, and have some exercises for you to go through to like just get smart on hey how do how do I program ladder logic for like these PLCs? Um, getting smart on the the regulations, uh, NIST. And all, all, all the actual regulatory stuff for, for EPA, CISA, uh, NERC, TSA, that, that, that's all free online on, ver on the appropriate government sites. Um, ISA, IEC, that, uh, it's, you, you gotta be a member to ISA for that. That's $105 a year. But if, you're, if you really wanna get into it, that, that's usually the best place to get it. You'd probably find it online somewhere, but don't wanna encourage that necessarily. Um, and then last resource I wanted to share with you guys is uh, the Industrial Security Podcast that um, co covers a lot of different topics. They, they have a lot of good guests on from, from various industries. They talk about different regulations, different approaches people have taken to trying to secure their environments. So that's a good resource. Um, and then what opportunities are there out there to get started and start kind of dipping your toes in? So networking is always usually one of the best ways to get started. The more people you know with the same interests, the more ideas are gonna flow, the, the, the more opportunities you're just gonna inherently find. Um, conferences, conferences and summits are always good, so B-Sides is always a great option for that. Um, SANS has a couple uh, ICS-specific uh, summits. Um, Dredos has, has a conference in November. Um, CISA used to do a joint working group twice a year. That has f fallen off. I think the last one they did was uh, fall 23. But if they pick those back up, those were always uh, great and those were all online. Um, and a lot of those conferences and summits have CTFs. Those are always uh, great opportunities to just get exposed to going through like uh, different packet captures or, or um, or doing like host, getting a chance to do some host forensics on uh, ICS specific devices, and then the the last opportunity that um, something I that helped me kind of get started was building automation systems. So those are the systems that are most um, most readily available. Essentially, right? You don't have to necessarily be working in an ICS OT job 
to have access to building automation because like this hotel is running some kind of building automation. The offices you work in, the if you live in an apartment, it might, it's probably running some kind of BAS. And so reach out, talk to whoever like the building manager is and ask them about it and just try, like, try and talk, to, talk somebody's ear off about building automation and how it all runs and see if they'll let you kind of get your hands dirty a little bit. Maybe not, and maybe they don't necessarily want you doing taking your first crack on like the HVAC for for your office. Everybody get angry if you you know crank up the the heat in the middle of July, but just getting some kind of exposure. And that's uh, that's all I got. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, if anyone has any anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's um, quite a few great contributors on, on LinkedIn. Um, you said Mike Holcomb? Yep. Yeah, networking. Anybody else? No? All right, well, thank you very much.